Chapter 35 of Lotus Buds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alice Jane. Lotus Buds by Amy Wilson Carmichael. Chapter 35. What if she misses her chance? Who would be planted chooseth not the soil? or here or there. Lord, even so, I ask one prayer, the which, if it be granted, it skills not where thou plantest me. Only I would be planted. T. E. Brown Two pictures of two evenings rise as I write. One is of an English fireside in a country house. The lamps have been lighted and the curtains drawn. The air is full of the undefined scent of chrysanthemums and the stronger sweetness of hyacinths comes from a stand in the window. Curled up in a roomy armchair by the fire sits a girl with a kitten asleep on her lap. She is reading a missionary book. The other is this, a white carved cupola in the center of a piece of water enclosed by white walls. People are sitting on the walls and pressing close about them in their thousands. A gorgeous barge is floating slowly round the shrine. There is very little moon, but the whole place is alight. Sometimes the water is ablaze with ruby and amber. This fades, and a weird blue-green shimmers across the barge, and electric lamps at the corners of the square lend brilliancy to the scene. The barge is covered with crimson trappings, and hundreds of wreaths of white oleander hang curtain-wise round what is within. The god and goddess, decked with jewels and smothered in flowers, Round and round the barge is pulled, and in the colored light all that is gaudy and tawdry is toned, and becomes only oriental and impressive. And the white shrine in the center reflected in the calm colored water appears in its alternating dimness, and shining more like a fairy creation than common handiwork. We who were at the festival, three of us laden with packets of marked gospels, met sometimes as we wandered about unobserved, losing ourselves in the crowd, that we might the more quietly continue that for which we were there. And in one such chance meeting we spoke of the English girl by the fireside, and longed to show her what we saw, and to show it with such earnestness that she would be drawn to inquire where her master had most need of her. But no earnestness of writing can do much, after all. It is true the eye affects the heart, and we would show what we have seen in the hopes that even the second-hand sight might do something. But words are clumsy, and cannot discover to another that poignant thing the eye has power to transmit to the heart. And it is well that it is so, for something stronger and more consuming than human emotion can ever be must operate upon the heart if the life is to be moved to purpose. A moving story is worth little, if it only moves the feelings. How far out of its selfish track does it move the life into ways of sacrifice? That is the question that matters. What if it cost? Did not Calvary cost? Away with the cold, calculating love that talks to itself about cost. God give us a pure passion of love that knows nothing of hesitation and grudging and measuring, nothing of compromise. What if it seem impossible to face all that surrender may mean? Is there not provision for the impossible? In the Old Testament we find that in almost every case of people being clothed with the Spirit, it was for things which were impossible to them. To be filled with the Spirit means readiness for Him to take us out of our present sphere and put us anywhere away from our own choice into His choice for us. These words hold a message alike for us as we meet and pass in that Indian crowd, and for the girl by the fireside at home who wants to know her Lord's will that she may do it, and whose heart's prayer is, May thy grace, O Lord, make that possible to me, which is impossible by nature. Let us have done with limitations. Let us be simply sincere. How ashamed we shall be by and by of our insincerities. The vows are on me, O, oh, to serve thee truly. Pants, pants my soul to perfectly obey. Burn, burn, O oh fire, O oh wind, now winnow thoroughly. Constrain, inspire to follow all the way. 
O oh, that in me thou, my Lord, may see of the travail of thy soul, and be satisfied. We had only a few hours to spend in the town of the floating festival, and being anxious to discover how things were among the temple community, I spent the first hour in their quarter, a block of substantial buildings, each in its own compound, near the temple. I saw the house from which two of our dearest children came, delivered by a miracle. It looked like a fortress, with its wall all round, an upstairs balcony barred by a trellis. The street door was locked as the women were at the festival. In another of less dignified appearance I saw a pretty woman of about twenty, dressed in pale blue and gold, evidently just ready to go out. One of those abandoned beings whose function it is to secure little children to continue the succession was in the house, and so nothing could be attempted but the most casual conversation. All the other houses in the block were locked, as the women were out, but I saw a new house outside, built in best Indian style and finely finished. It had been built for, and given as a free gift, to a noted temple woman. These houses would open, in the missionary sense of the word, but not in an afternoon. It would take time and careful endeavor to win an entrance. Such a worker would need to be one whom no disappointment could discourage, a woman to whom the word had been spoken, Go, love, according to the love of the Lord. When will such a worker come? As I left the temple quarter, I met my two companions who had been at work elsewhere, and we walked together to the place of festival. Tripping gaily along in front was a little maid with flowers in her hair. It was easy to know who she was. There was something in the very step that marked the light-footed temple child. Poor little, all-unconscious illustration of India's need of God. Later on we saw the same illustration again, lighted up like a great transparency, the focus for a thousand eyes. For on the dais of the barge, in the place of honor nearest the idols, stood three women and a child. The women were swathed in fold upon fold of rich violet silk, sprinkled all over with tinsel and gold. They were crowned with white flowers, wreathed round a golden ornament, like a full moon set in their dark hair and the effect of the whole, seen in the luminous flush of color thrown upon them from the shore, was as if the night sky sparkling with stars had come down and robed them where they stood. Then when it paled, and sheet lightning played, as it seemed, across water and barge and shrine, the effect was wholly mysterious. The three swaying forms, for they swayed keeping time to the music that never ceased, resembled one's idea of goddesses rather than familiar womankind. To the Indian mind it was beautiful, bewilderingly beautiful, and the simple country folk around drew deep breaths of admiration as they passed. The little girl looked more human. She too was in violet silk and spangles of gold, and her little head was wreathed with flowers. It may have been her first floating festival, for she gazed about her with eyes full of guileless wonder, and the women beside whom she stood laid a light, protecting hand upon her shoulder. That little child! How the sight of her held us in pity as the barge sailed slowly round! She was so near to us at times that we could almost have touched her when the barge came near the wall, and yet she was utterly remote miles of space might have lain between. It was as if we and she belonged to different planets, and yet our little ones, who might have been as she, were so close, we could almost feel their loving little arms round our necks at that moment. This child, how far away she was! Had one of us set foot on the place where she stood, the friendly thousands about us would have changed in a second into indignant furies, and so long as the memory of such impiety remained, no white face would have been welcome at the floating festival. We stood by the wall a while, and watched. The sorrow of it all sank into us. There, in the holiest place of all, according to their thinking, close to the emblems of deity, they had set this grievous perversion of the holy and the pure— Right on the topmost pinnacle of everything known as religious, there they had enthroned it, and robed it in starlight, and crowned it as queens are crowned. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, 
One thing have I desired of the Lord, to behold the fair beauty of the Lord. Such words open chasms of contrast. God pity them, like those of old, they know not what they do. We came away, our books all sold and our strength of voice spent out, for everywhere people had listened, and as we came home, strong thanksgiving filled our hearts. Thanks and praise unspeakable for the little lives safe in our nursery, for the two especially who but for God's interposition might have been on that barge. And oh, from the ground of our heart we were grateful that he had not let us miss his will concerning these little children. We thought of those special two with their dear little innocent ways. We could not think of them on the barge. We could not bear to think of it. Again and again we thanked God with humble, adoring thanksgiving that he kept us from missing our chance. But the mere thinking of that intolerable thought brought us back upon another thought. What of that girl by the fireside? What if she misses her chance? We know, for letters confess it, that many a life has missed its chance. What of the woman, strong and keen, with pent-up energies waiting for she knows not what? What of the girl by the fireside crushing down the sense of that under-call that will not let her rest? The work to which that call would lead her will not be anything great. It will only mean little, humble, everyday doings wherever she is sent. But if the call is a true call from heaven, it will change to a song as she obeys. And through all the afterward of life, through all the loneliness that may come, through all the disillusions when her dreams of fair romance which no day brings slip away from her, and the usual and commonplace are all about her, then and forever that song of the Lord will sing itself through the quiet places of her soul, and she will be sure, with the sureness that is just pure peace, that she is where her master meant her to be. Not that we would write as if obedience must always mean service in the foreign field. We know it is not so. We know it may be quite the opposite. But shall we not be forgiven if we sometimes wonder how it is that with so much earnest church life at home, with so many evangelistic campaigns and conventions, there is so poor an output so far as these lands abroad are concerned? Can it be that so many are meant to stay at home? We would never urge any individual friend to come, far less would we plead for numbers, however great the need. We would only say this, Will the girl by the fireside, if such a one reads this book, lay the book aside and spend an hour alone with her Lord? Will she, if she is in doubt about his will, wait upon him to show it to her? Will she ask him to fit her to obey? And this I wish to do, this I desire. Whatsoever is wanting in me, do thou, I beseech thee, vouchsafe to supply. Forgive if we seem to intrude upon holy ground, but sometimes we see in imagination some great gathering of God's people, and we hear them singing hymns, and sometimes the beautiful words change into others not beautiful, but only insistent. The Lord our God arouse us, we are sleeping, dreaming we wake, while through the heavy night, hardly perceived, the foe moves on unchallenged, glad of the dream that doth delay the fight. O Christ, our captain, lead us out to battle. Shame on the sloth of soldiers of the light. Good shepherd, Jesus, pitiful and tender, to whom the least of straying lambs is known, grant us thy love that wearieth not, nor faileth. Grant us to seek thy wayward sheep that roam, far on the fell, until we find and fold them, safe in the love of thee, their own true home. End of chapter 35